book eight chapter six of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six seven centuries had elapsed since charlemagne had attached a college of canons to this cathedral over whose school oswald myconius then presided these canons having degenerated from their first institution and desiring in their benefices to enjoy the sweets of indolence elected a priest to preach and to take the cure of souls this situation having become vacant some time after oswald's arrival he immediately thought of his friend what a prize it would be for zurich zwinglius's appearance was prepossessing he was a handsome man of graceful address and pleasing manners his eloquence had already given him celebrity while the lustre of his genius made him conspicuous among all the confederates myconius spoke of him to the provost of the chapter felix fry who from the appearance and talents of zwinglius was already prepossessed in his favour to utinger an old man who was held in high respect and to canon hoffmann a man of an upright open disposition who having long preached against foreign service was favourably inclined to ulrich other zurichers had on different occasions heard zwinglius at einsiedlen and had returned full of admiration the election of preacher to the cathedral soon set all the inhabitants of zurich in motion different parties were formed several laboured night and day for the election of the eloquent preacher of our lady of the eremites myconius having informed his friend wednesday next replied zwinglius i will come and dine at zurich and talk over matters he accordingly arrived a canon to whom he was paying a visit said to him could you come among us to preach the word of god i could replied he but will not come unless i am called he then returned to his abbey this visit spread alarm in the camp of his enemies several priests were urged to apply for the vacancy a swabian named laurent fable even preached as a candidate and the rumour went that he was elected it is then quite true said zwinglius on learning it that a prophet has no honour in his own country since a swabian is preferred to a swiss i know what value to set on popular applause zwinglius immediately after received a letter from the secretary of cardinal schiner informing him that the election had not taken place but the false news which he had at first received nettled the curate of einsiedlen knowing that a person so unworthy as this fable aspired to the place he was more desirous to obtain it for himself and wrote about it to myconius who next day replied fable will always continue fable my masters have learned that he is already the father of six boys and possesses i know not how many benefices the enemies of zwinglius did not abandon their opposition all it is true agreed in extolling his learning to the skies but said some he is too fond of music others he loves the world and pleasure others again in early life he was too closely connected with giddy companions there was even one individual who charged him with an instance of seduction zwinglius was not without blemish though superior to the ecclesiastics of his time he more than once in the first years of his ministry gave way to youthful propensities it is difficult to estimate the influence of an impure atmosphere on those who live in it there were in the papacy certain established irregularities allowed and sanctioned as conformable to the laws of nature a saying of Aincas Silvius, afterwards Pope under the name of Pius the Second, gives an idea of the sad state of public morals at this period. Disorder had become the rule, order the exception. Oswald displayed the greatest activity in favour of his friend. He exerted all his powers in defending him, and happily succeeded. He went to Burgomaster Roust, to Hoffmann, Fry, and Uttinger. 
he praised Zwinglius for his probity, honesty, and purity, and confirmed the Zurichers in the favourable opinion which they had of the curate of Einsiedlin. Little credit was given to the speeches of his adversaries. The most influential persons said that Zwinglius should be preacher at Zurich. The canons said so also, but in a whisper. Hope, wrote Oswald to him with a full heart, for I hope. At the same time he told him of the accusations of his enemies. Although Zwinglius was not yet become altogether a new man, he belonged to the class of those whose conscience is awakened, and who may fall into sin, but never without a struggle or without remorse. It had often been his resolution to stand alone in the midst of the world, and maintain a life of holiness but when he saw himself accused, he did not pretend to boast that he was without sin. Writing to Canon Utinger, he said, Having nobody to go along with me in the resolutions which I had formed, several, even of those about me, being offended at them, alas, I fell, and, like the dog of whom St. Peter speaks, 2 Peter 2, verse 22, returned to my vomit, Ah, God knows with what shame and anguish I have torn up these faults from the depths of my heart, and laid them before Almighty God, to whom, however, I would be less afraid to confess my misery than to mortal man. But while Zwinglius confessed himself to be a sinner, he at the same time vindicated himself from the most offensive charges which were brought against him. He declared that he had ever abhorred the idea of invading the sanctity of married life or seducing innocence, vices at that time but too common. For the truth of this, says he, I appeal to all with whom I have lived. The election took place on the 11th of December, and out of the 24 votes which were given, Zwinglius had 17. It was time that the Reformation should begin in Switzerland. The chosen instrument which divine providence had been preparing during the three years in the retreat of Einsiedlen was ready, and must now be translated elsewhere. God, who had chosen the new University of Wittenberg, situated in the heart of Germany, and under the protection of the wisest of princes to call Luther thither, made choice in Switzerland of the city of Zurich, regarded as the head of the confederation, there to station Zwinglius, and to bring him into contact not only with one of the most intelligent, simple, resolute, and intrepid communities of Switzerland, but also with all the cantons which are grouped around this ancient and powerful state. The hand which had taken hold of a young shepherd of Santis, and led him to the school of Wesen, now brought him forward powerful in word and in deed, in the face of all, to regenerate his countrymen. Zurich was about to become a focus of light to Switzerland. The day which announced the election of Zwinglius was to Einsiedlen a day at once of joy and grief. The circle which had been formed there was about to be broken up by the withdrawal of its most valuable member, and who could say whether superstition was not going again to take possession of this ancient place of pilgrimage? The Council of State in Schwitz conveyed the expression of its sentiments to Ulrich by designating him as reverend, learned, most gracious master, and good friend. At least do you yourself give us a successor worthy of you, said Geraldsek in despair to Zwinglius. I have got for you, replied he, a little lion, simple and wise, a man initiated in the mysteries of sacred science. Let me have him, immediately rejoined the administrator. It was Leo Judah, at once the gentle and intrepid friend with whom Zwinglius had been so intimate at Baal. Leo accepted the call which brought him near his dear Ulrich. Ulrich took farewell of his friends, quitted the solitude of Einsiedlen, and arrived at that delightful spot where, smiling and instinct with life, rises the town of Zurich, surrounded by its amphitheatre of vine-clad hills, enamelled with meadows and orchards, crowned with forests, and overtopped by the lofty peaks of the Albis. 
Zurich, the centre of the political interests of Switzerland, where the most influential persons in the nation frequently assembled, was the place best fitted to act upon the whole country and shed the seeds of truth over all its cantons. Accordingly, the friends of letters and the Bible hailed the appointment of Zwinglius with acclamation. At Paris, in particular, the Swiss students, who were there in great numbers, were enraptured with the news. But if Zwinglius had the prospect of a great victory at Zurich, he had also the prospect of a severe contest. Glarion wrote him from Paris, I foresee that your learning will stir up great enmity, but be of good courage, and you will, like Hercules, subdue monsters. On the 27th of December, 1518, Zwinglius arrived at Zurich and took up his quarters at the Hotel of Einsiedlin. He received a cordial and honourable welcome. The chapter immediately met to receive him and invited him to take his seat in the midst of them. Felix Frey presided. The canons, friendly or hostile to Zwinglius, sat indiscriminately around their provost. There was considerable excitement in the meeting. Everyone felt, perhaps without distinctly acknowledging it to himself, how serious the commencement of this ministry was likely to prove. Some apprehension being entertained of the innovating spirit of the young priest, it was agreed to set before him the most important duties of his office. "'You will use your utmost endeavour," he was gravely told, to secure payment of the revenues of the chapter without neglecting the least of them. You will exhort the faithful, both from the pulpit and in the confessional, to pay the first fruits and tithes, and to show by their offerings that they love the church. You will make it your business to increase the revenues which are derived from the sick, from sacrifices, and generally from every ecclesiastical act. The chapter added, as to the administration of the sacraments, preaching and personal presence amid the flock, these too are the duties of the priest. However, in these different respects, and particularly in regard to preaching, you may supply your place by a vicar. You should administer the sacraments only to persons of distinction, and after being requested. You are expressly forbidden to do it to all persons indiscriminately strange rule to be given to zwinglius money money still money was it then for this that christ established his ministry still prudence tempers his zeal he knows that we cannot all at once deposit the seed in the ground see the growth of the tree and gather its fruit zwinglius therefore without explaining his views on what was enjoined him humbly expressed his gratitude for the honourable appointment which he had received, and stated what he calculated on being able to do. The life of Jesus, said he, has been too long hidden from the people. I will preach on the whole Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter by chapter, following the mind of the Holy Spirit, drawing only at the wellsprings of Scripture, digging deep into it and seeking the understanding of it by persevering fervent prayer i will consecrate my ministry to the glory of god the praise of his only son the real salvation of souls and their instruction in the true faith this new language made a deep impression on the chapter some expressed joy but the majority openly disapproved this mode of preaching is an innovation exclaimed they this innovation will soon lead to others and where is it to stop canon hoffman in particular thought it his duty to prevent the fatal effects of a choice which he had himself patronized this exposition of scripture said he will be more hurtful than useful to the people it is not a new method replied zwinglius it is the ancient method Recollect the homilies of St. Chrysostom on St. Matthew, and of St. Augustine on St. John. Besides, I will use moderation, and give none any reason to complain. Thus Zwinglius abandoned the exclusive use of fragments of the Gospel, as practised since the days of Charlemagne. 
re-establishing the scripture in its ancient rites he from the commencement of his ministry united the reformation to the primitive ages of christianity and prepared a more profound study of the word of god for ages to come but he did more the strong and independent position which he took up in the face of the church showed that the work in which he had engaged was new the figure of the reformer stood out in bold relief to the public eye and the reformation advanced hoffman having failed in the chapter addressed a written request to the provost to prohibit zwinglius from shaking the popular belief the provost sent for the new preacher and spoke to him with great kindness but no human power could close his lips on the thirty first of december he wrote to the council of glaris that he entirely resigned the cure of souls which had hitherto been reserved for him and gave himself wholly to zurich and to the work which god was preparing for him in this town on saturday being new year's day and also the birthday of zwinglius who had completed his thirty-fifth year he mounted the pulpit of the cathedral a great crowd eager to see a man who had already acquired so much celebrity and to hear this new gospel of which every one began to speak filled the church it is to christ said zwinglius that i wish to conduct you to christ the true source of salvation his divine word is the only nourishment which i would give to your heart and life then he announced that to-morrow the first sunday of the year he would begin to expound the gospel according to st matthew accordingly the preacher and a still larger audience than the day before were at their posts zwinglius opened the gospel the gospel which had so long been a sealed book and read the first page going over the history of the patriarchs and prophets mentioned in the first chapter of st matthew and expounding it in such a way that all were astonished and delighted and exclaimed we never heard anything like this he continued thus to expound st matthew according to the original greek he showed how the whole bible found at once its exposition and its application in the very nature of man delivering the loftiest truths of the gospel in simple language his preaching reached all classes the learned and the wise as well as the ignorant and simple he extolled the infinite mercies of god the father and implored all his hearers to put their confidence in jesus christ alone as the only saviour at the same time he earnestly called them to repentance forcibly attacked the errors which prevailed among the people fearlessly rebuked luxury intemperance extravagance in dress the oppression of the poor idleness foreign service and foreign pensions in the pulpit says one of his companions he spared no one pope emperor kings dukes princes lords not even the confederates all his energy and all the joy of his heart were in god accordingly he exhorted all the inhabitants of zurich to put their confidence in him only never was man heard to speak with so much authority says oswald myconius who with joy and high hopes watched the labours of his friend the gospel could not be preached in vain in zurich a continually increasing multitude of men of all classes and more especially of the common people flocked to hear him several juricas had ceased to attend on public worship i derive no benefit from the discourses of these priests often exclaimed fuslin a poet historian and counsellor of state they do not preach the things of salvation for they do not comprehend them i see nothing in them but covetousness and voluptuousness henry reichlin treasurer of state one who diligently read the scriptures was of the same opinion the priests said he met in thousands at the council of constance to burn the best man among them these distinguished men led by curiosity went to hear zwinglius's first sermon their countenances bespoke the emotion with which they followed the orator glory to god said they on coming out this is a preacher of the truth he will be our moses to deliver us from egyptian darkness 
from this moment they became the reformer's intimate friends powers of the world said fuslin cease to proscribe the doctrine of christ after christ the son of god was put to death sinners were raised up and now should you destroy the preachers of truth you will see their places supplied by glaziers carpenters potters founders shoemakers and tailors who will teach with power in zurich at the outset there was only one shout of admiration but when the first moment of enthusiasm was over the adversary resumed courage worthy persons alarmed at the idea of a reformation gradually drew off from zwinglius the violence of the monks which had been veiled for an instant reappeared and the college of canons resounded with complaints zwinglius stood immovable his friends beholding his courage felt in his presence as if a man of apostolic times had reappeared among his enemies some scoffed and jeered others uttered insulting menaces but he endured all with christian patience whoso he was wont to say would gain the wicked to jesus christ must wink at many things an admirable saying which ought not to be lost sight of his character and general bearing towards all contributed as much as his discourses to win their hearts he was at once a true christian and a true republican the equality of mankind was not with him a mere watchword it was written on his heart and manifested in his life he had neither that pharisaical pride nor that monastic gruffness which are equally offensive to the simple and the wise of the world men were drawn towards him and felt at ease when conversing with him strong and mighty in the pulpit he was affable to all whom he met in the streets or in the public squares at the places where the merchants or incorporations met he was often seen among the citizens expounding the leading points of christian doctrine or conversing familiarly with them he gave the same cordial reception to peasant and patrician he invited country folks to dine with him says one of his bitterest enemies walked with them spoke to them of god and made the devil enter into their hearts and his writings into their pockets he even went so far that the leading persons in zurich visited those peasants entertained them and walked over the town with them showing them all sorts of attention he continued to cultivate music with moderation says bullinger nevertheless the enemies of the gospel took advantage of it and called him the evangelical flute and lute player faber having one day reproached him with his fondness for music zwinglius with noble candour replied my dear faber you know not what music is i have it is true learned to play on the lute the violin and other instruments and am able by these means to pacify little children but you of course are too holy for music do you not know that david was a skilful player on the harp and in this way drove the evil spirit out of saul ah if you knew the sound of the heavenly lute the evil spirit of ambition and avarice by which you are possessed would come out of you also perhaps this was zwinglius's foible though it was in a spirit of cheerfulness and christian liberty that he cultivated this art which religion has always associated with her sublimest flights he set some of his christian poems to music and did not scruple sometimes to amuse the youngest of his flock with his lute he showed the same good nature to the poor he ate and drank says one of his contemporaries with all who invited him he despised no one he was most compassionate to the poor always firm and always joyful in bad as in good fortune no evil made him afraid his words were at all times full of energy and his heart full of consolation thus zwinglius increased in popularity after the example of his master seated alternately at the table of the common people and the banquet of the great but still constantly intent on the work to which god had called him at the same time he was an indefatigable student in the morning till ten he read wrote and translated hebrew in particular engaged his attention 
after dinner he attended to those who had anything to tell him or any advice to ask of him took a walk with his friends and visited his hearers at two he resumed his studies he took a short walk after supper and afterwards wrote letters which often occupied him till midnight he always stood when he studied and did not allow himself to be interrupted unless on important business but the labours of a single individual were not sufficient a person named lucian one day came to him with the writings of the german reformer he had been sent by renan a learned man then resident at Baal and indefatigable in circulating the reformer's writings throughout switzerland renan had become aware that the hawking of books was an important means of diffusing evangelical doctrine lucian had travelled almost over the whole of switzerland and knew everybody see said renan to zwinglius whether this lucian has the necessary prudence and ability if he has let him go from town to town burr to burr village to village and even from house to house among the swiss with luther's writings especially his exposition on the lord's prayer written for the laity the more he is known the more purchasers he will find but care must be taken not to let him hawk other books if he has none but luther's his sale of them will be the greater thus the humble roof of many a swiss family was penetrated with some rays of light there was one other book however which zwinglius should have caused to be hawked with those of luther the gospel of jesus christ end of book 8 chapter 6book eight chapter seven of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume two by jean henri mail d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven zwinglius had not long to wait for an opportunity of displaying his zeal in a new vocation samson the famous indulgence merchant was slowly approaching zurich this miserable trafficker had come from schwitz to zug twentieth of september fifteen eighteen and had remained there three days an immense crowd had gathered round him the poorest were the most eager so that they prevented the rich from coming forward this did not suit the monk accordingly one of his attendants began to bawl out to the populace good people do not throng so let those come who have money we will afterwards try to content those who have none from zug samson and his band repaired to lucerne from lucerne to unterwald then crossing the fertile alps with their rich valleys passing beneath the eternal ice of oberland and in these spots the grandest in switzerland exposing their roman merchandise they arrived near bern the monk was at first prohibited to enter the town but succeeded at last in obtaining an introduction by means of persons whom he had in his pay exhibiting his wares in the church of st vincent he began to cry louder than ever here said he to the rich are indulgences on parchment for a crown there said he to the poor are indulgences on ordinary paper for two farthings one day a celebrated knight james de stein came up prancing on a dapple grey horse the monk greatly admired the horse give me says the knight an indulgence for myself for my troop of five hundred strong for all my vassals of belp and all my ancestors i will give you my dapple grey horse in exchange it was a high price for the horse but the courser pleased the franciscan and the bargain was struck the horse went to the monk's stable and all these souls were declared for ever exempted from hell another day he gave a burgher for thirteen florins an indulgence in virtue of which his confessor was authorized to absolve him from any species of perjury so much was samson in repute that counsellor may an enlightened old man having said something against him was obliged to go down on his knees and ask pardon of the arrogant monk 
this was the monk's last day and a loud ringing of bells announced his immediate departure from bern samson was in the church standing on the steps of the high altar canon henry lupulus formerly zwinglius's master was acting as his interpreter when the wolf and the fox rendezvous together in the field said canon anselm turning to the schultes of valleville the best thing for you worthy sir is to put your sheep and geese in safety but the monk cared little for these sarcasms which besides did not reach his ear kneel said he to the superstitious crowd repeat three paters three ave marias and your souls will be forthwith as pure as at the moment of baptism then all the people fell upon their knees samson wishing even to outdo himself exclaimed i deliver from the torments of purgatory and hell all the spirits of the departed bernese whatever may have been the manner and place of their death these jugglers like those at fairs keep their finest feet for the last samson set out with a heavy purse towards zurich crossing argovia and baden the farther on he got the monk whose appearance on passing the alps was so shabby proceeded with more pride and splendour the bishop of constance irritated that samson had not employed him to legalise his bulls had forbidden all the curates of his diocese to open their churches to him at baden nevertheless the curate durst not long oppose his traffic this redoubled the monk's effrontery making the round of the burying ground at the head of a procession he seemed to fix his eyes on some object in the air while his acolytes sung the hymn for the dead and pretending to see souls flying from the burying ground to heaven he exclaimed ecce volant see how they fly one day an inhabitant of the place getting up into the church steeple a great number of feathers were soon seen in the air falling down on the astonished procession see how they fly exclaimed the wag of baden shaking a feather cushion from the steeple many began to laugh samson fell into a rage and could not be appeased till he learned that the individual was subject to fits of derangement he left baden in a huff continuing his journey he arrived towards the end of february fifteen nineteen at bremgarten at the solicitation of the schultes and second curate who had seen him at baden no individual in that district had a higher reputation than dean bullinger of bremgarten though far from enlightened as to the errors of the church and the word of god being open zealous eloquent kind to the poor and ready to do a service to the humblest he was loved by everybody he had in his youth formed a connection with the daughter of a counsellor of the place this was the usual expedient of such of the priests as were unwilling to live in general licentiousness anna had borne him five sons but this had in no way lessened the respect which the dean enjoyed there was not in switzerland a more hospitable house than his a great lover of the chase he was seen surrounded with ten or twelve dogs and accompanied by the barons of halville the abbot murie and the gentry of zurich scouring the fields and forests around he kept open table and none of his guests was more jovial than himself when the deputies to the diet were on their way to baden on passing through bremgarten they failed not to take their seats at the dean's table bullinger said they keeps court like the most powerful baron in this house strangers remarked a child of an intelligent countenance henry one of the dean's sons from his earliest years had many narrow escapes having been seized with the plague preparations were making for his funeral when he showed some signs of life and was restored to his delighted parents on another occasion a wandering beggar having won him by caresses was carrying him off from his family when some persons in passing recognized and rescued him at three years of age he could repeat the lord's prayer and the apostles creed 
one day having slipped into the church he got into his father's pulpit stood up gravely and at the full stretch of his voice cried out i believe in god the father and so on at twelve he was sent to the latin school of emmerich his heart overwhelmed with fear for those times were dangerous for a young boy without experience when the students of a university thought its discipline too severe they not unfrequently left it in troops carrying the children with them and encamped in the woods from which they sent the youngest of their number to beg or sometimes with arms in their hands they rushed forth on the passing traveller robbed him and then consumed their booty in debauchery henry was happily kept from evil in this distant abode like luther he gained his livelihood by singing before the houses for his father wished to teach him to live by his own shifts he was sixteen when he opened a new testament i found in it says he everything necessary for man's salvation and thenceforth i laid it down as a principle to follow the holy scriptures alone and reject all human additions i believe neither the fathers nor myself but explain scripture by scripture without adding anything or taking anything away god was thus preparing this young man who was one day to succeed zwinglius he is the author of the manuscript journal which we often quote about this time samson arrived at bremgarten with all his train the bold dean undismayed by this petty italian army prohibited the monk from vending his wares in his neighbourhood the schultes town clerk and second pastor samson's friends had met in a room of the inn at which he had alighted and were standing quite disconcerted around the impatient monk the dean arrived here are the papal bulls said the monk to him open your church the dean i will not allow the purses of my parishioners to be emptied by means of letters not authenticated for the bishop has not legalized them the monk in a solemn tone the pope is above the bishop i enjoin you not to deprive your flock of this distinguished grace the dean should it cost me my life i won't open my church the monk with indignation rebellious priest in the name of our most holy lord the pope i pronounce against you the greater excommunication and will not absolve you till you ransom your unheard-of audacity at the price of three hundred ducats the dean turning on his heel and retiring i will know how to answer before my lawful judges as for you and your excommunication i have nothing to do with them the monk transported with rage impudent brute i am on my way to zurich and will there lay my complaint before the deputies of the confederation the dean i can appear there as well as you and this instant i set out while these things were taking place at bremgarten zwinglius who saw the enemy gradually approaching kept preaching vigorously against indulgences vicar faber of constance encouraged him promising him the bishop's support i know said samson while proceeding towards zurich that zwinglius will attack me but i will stop his mouth zwinglius was in truth too much alive to the value of pardon by christ not to attack the paper indulgences of these men often like luther he trembled because of sin but in the saviour found deliverance from his fears this modest but brave man was advancing in the knowledge of god when satan frightens me said he by crying to me you do not this and you do not that and yet god commands them immediately the soft voice of the gospel consoles me saying what thou canst not do and assuredly thou canst do nothing christ does for thee yes continues the pious evangelist when my heart is agonized because of my powerlessness and the feebleness of my flesh my spirit revives at the sound of this glad news christ is thy innocence christ is thy righteousness christ is thy salvation thou art nothing thou canst do nothing christ is the alpha and the omega 
Christ is all and can do all. All created things will forsake and deceive thee, but Christ, the Holy and Righteous One, will receive and justify thee. Yes, exclaims Zwinglius, he is our righteousness, and the righteousness of all who shall ever appear as righteous before the judgment seat of God. Indulgences could not stand a moment when confronted with such truths, and hence Zwinglius never hesitated to attack them. No man, said he, is able to forgive sins. Christ alone, very God and very man, is able to do it. Go, buy indulgences, but rest assured you are not at all forgiven. Those who vend forgiveness of sins for money are the companions of Simon Magus, the friends of Balaam, and the ambassadors of Satan. Dean Bullinger, still warm from his conference with the monk, arrived at Zurich before him. He came to complain to the Diet against this shameless dealer and his traffic. Envoys from the bishop had arrived for the same purpose. They made common cause and promised to support each other. The spirit which animated Zwinglius breathed upon this town, and the Council of State resolved to oppose the monk's entry into Zurich. Samson had arrived in the suburbs and alighted at an inn. One foot was already on the stirrup preparatory to his entry when deputies from the council arrived, and while making the customary offer of wine to him as a papal envoy, intimated to him that he might dispense with appearing in Zurich. "'I have something to communicate to the Diet in the name of His Holiness,' replied the monk. It was a trick. However, it was resolved to admit him, but as he spoke only of his bulls he was dismissed after being compelled to retract the excommunication which he had pronounced against the dean of bremgarten he went off in a rage and the pope shortly after recalled him to italy a car drawn by three horses and loaded with the money of which his lies had robbed the poor preceded him on the steep tracts of st gotthard which eight months before he had crossed in poverty without style merely the bearer of a few papers on this occasion the helvetic showed more firmness than the germanic diet the reason was because no cardinals and bishops sat in it hence the pope deprived of these supports dealt more gently with switzerland than germany in other respects the affair of indulgences which played so important a part in the reformation of germany is only an episode in that of switzerland End of Book 8, Chapter 7。Book 8, Chapter 8 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Zwinglius did not spare himself. His many labours called for some relaxation, and he was ordered to the baths of Fethes. Ah, said Hierus, one of the pupils who lodged with him, and who thus expressed the feeling of all who knew Zwinglius, had I a hundred tongues, a hundred mouths, a brazen throat, as Virgil expresses it, or rather had I the eloquence of Cicero, how could I express all I owe to you, and all that I feel at this separation? Zwinglius, however, set out and reached Pfeffers through the astonishing gorge formed by the impetuous torrent of the Jamina. He descended into that infernal abyss, as the hermit David called it, and arrived at the baths which are perpetually agitated by the dashing of the torrent and bedewed by the spray of its foaming water. Where Zwinglius lodged, it was so dark that candles were burnt at midday. He was even assured by the inmates that frightful phantoms sometimes appeared in the darkness. Even here Zwinglius found opportunity to serve his master. His affability won the heart of several of the patients, among others a celebrated poet, Philip Ingentinus, professor at Freiburg in Brigau, who thenceforward became a zealous supporter of the Reformation. God watched over his own work, and was pleased to hasten it. Zwinglius's defect lay in his strength. 
strong in body strong in character strong in talents he was to see all these varieties of strength broken that he might thereby become such an instrument as god loves to employ he stood in need of baptism that of adversity infirmity feebleness and pain such a baptism luther had received at that period of agony when the cell and long passages of the convent of erfurt resounded with his cries zwinglius was to receive it by being brought into contact with sickness and death the heroes of this world the charles twelfths and napoleons have a moment which is decisive of their career and their glory and it is when they all at once become conscious of their strength there is an analogous moment in the life of god's heroes but it is in a contrary direction it is when they recognize their impotence and nothingness thenceforth they receive strength from on high such a work as that of which zwinglius was to be the instrument is never accomplished by man's natural strength it would immediately wither away like a tree transplanted after its full growth and when in full leaf a plant must be feeble in order to take root and a grain of corn must die in the ground before it can yield a full return god led zwinglius and with him the work of which he was the stay to the gates of the grave it is from among bones and darkness and the dust of the dead that god is pleased to take the instruments by means of which he illumines regenerates and revives the earth zwinglius was hidden among the immense rocks which hem in the furious torrent of the gemina when he unexpectedly learned that the plague or as it was termed the great death was at zurich this dreadful scourge broke out in august on st lawrence day lasted till candlemas and carried off two thousand five hundred persons the young people who lodged with zwinglius had immediately left conformably to directions which he had given his house was empty but it was to him the very moment to return he hurriedly quitted pfeffers and reappearing in the bosom of his flock now decimated by the plague he immediately sent to wildhaus for his young brother andrew who wished to attend him from that moment he devoted himself entirely to the victims of this dreadful scourge every day he preached christ and his consolations to the sick his friends delighted to see him safe and sound in the midst of so many fatal darts still felt a secret alarm conrad brunner who himself died of the plague a few months after writing him from baal said do good but at the same time remember to take care of your life it was too late zwinglius was seized with the plague the great preacher of switzerland was stretched on a bed from which perhaps he was never again to rise he communed with himself and turned his eye heavenward he knew that christ had given him a sure inheritance and disclosing the feelings of his heart in a hymn remarkable for unction and simplicity of which not being able to give the antique and expressive phraseology we have endeavoured to preserve the rhythm and literal meaning he exclaimed my door has opened death appears my god my strength dispel all fears o oh, jesus raise thy pierced arm and break the sword that caused alarm but if my soul in life's midday thy voice recalls then i obey ah let me die for i am thine thy mansions wait such faith as mine meanwhile the disease gains ground and this man the hope of the church and of switzerland is beheld by his despairing friends as about to become the prey of the tomb his senses and strength forsake him his heart becomes alarmed but he is still able to turn towards god and exclaims my ills increase haste to console terrors overwhelm my heart and soul death is at hand my senses fail my voice is choked now christ prevail lo satan strains to snatch his prey i feel his hand must i give way 
he harms me not i fear no loss for here i lie before thy cross canon hoffman sincere in his own belief could not bear the idea of allowing zwinglius to die in the errors which he had preached accordingly he waited on the provost of the chapter and said to him think of the danger of his soul does he not give the name of fantastical innovators to all the doctors who have appeared for the last three hundred and eighty years and more to alexander hales st bonaventura albert the great thomas aquinas and all the canonists does he not maintain that their doctrines are the dreams which they dreamed in their cowls within the walls of their cloisters better had it been for the town of zurich that zwinglius had for a series of years destroyed our vintage and harvest there he lies at the brink of death do i beseech you save his poor soul it would seem that the provost was more enlightened than the canon and deemed it unnecessary to convert zwinglius to st bonaventura and albert the great he was left at peace the whole town was in mourning all the faithful cried to god night and day beseeching him to restore their faithful pastor terror had passed from zurich to the mountains of the tockenburg where also the plague had appeared seven or eight persons had perished in the village among them a servant of nicholas a brother of zwinglius no letter was received from the reformer and his young brother andrew wrote tell me my dear brother in what state you are the abbot and all our brothers desire to be remembered as the parents of zwinglius are not mentioned it would seem that they were now dead the news of zwinglius's illness and even a rumour of his death spread in switzerland and germany alas exclaimed hedio in tears the safety of the country the gospel trumpet the magnanimous herald of truth is smitten with death in the flower of his life and so to speak in the springtide of his days when the news reached baal the whole town was filled with lamentation and mourning the spark of life which remained in zwinglius was however rekindled though his body was still feeble his soul was impressed with the unaltered conviction that god had called him to replace the torch of his word on the candlestick of the church the plague had abandoned its victim and zwinglius exclaims with emotion my god my father healed by thee on earth again i bend my knee now sin no more shall mark my days my mouth henceforth shall sing thy praise the uncertain hour come when it may perchance may bring still worse dismay but let it come with joy i'll rise and bear my yoke straight to the skies zwinglius was no sooner able to hold the pen this was in the beginning of november than he wrote to his family this gave inexpressible delight to them all especially to his young brother andrew who himself died of the plague the following year and at whose death ulrich to use his own words wept and cried like a woman at baal conrad brunner a friend of zwinglius and bruno ammerbach a famous printer both young men were cut off after three days illness the rumour having spread in this town that zwinglius had also fallen the whole university was in mourning he whom god loves is perfected in the flower of his life said they how great was their joy when colinus a student of lucerne and afterwards a merchant in zurich brought word that zwinglius had escaped the jaws of death john faber vicar to the bishop of constance long the friend and afterwards the most violent adversary of zwinglius wrote to him o oh, my dear ulrich how delighted i am to learn that you have escaped the jaws of cruel death when you are in danger the christian commonwealth is threatened the design of the lord in these trials is to urge you forward in the pursuit of eternal life this was indeed the design and it was accomplished though in a different way from what faber anticipated the plague of fifteen hundred and nineteen which made such fearful ravages in the north of switzerland was in the hand of god a powerful means of converting a great number of persons 
but on none had it a greater influence than on zwinglius hitherto he had been too much disposed to regard the gospel as mere doctrine but now it became a great reality he returned from the gates of the grave with a new heart his zeal was more active his life more holy his word more free christian and powerful this was the period of zwinglius's complete emancipation he from this time devoted himself to god the new life thus given to the reformer was communicated at the same time to the swiss reformation the divine rod the great death in passing over all their mountains and descending into all their valleys added to the sacredness of the movement which was then taking place the reformation being plunged like zwinglius into the waters of affliction and of grace came forth purer and more animated in regard to the regeneration of switzerland the gospel sun was now at its height zwinglius who still strongly felt the want of new strength received it in intercourse with his friends his closest intimacy was with myconius they walked hand in hand like luther and melanchthon oswald was happy at zurich it is true his position was cramped but everything was softened by the virtues of his modest spouse it was of her that glarion said were i to meet a young girl resembling her i would prefer her to the daughter of a king but a faithful voice was often heard disturbing the sweet friendship of zwinglius and myconius it was that of canon xylotect who calling to oswald from lucerne summoned him to return to his country lucerne said he to him not zurich is your country you say that the zurichers are your friends granted but do you know what the evening star will bring you serve your country this i advise i implore and if i am able command Xylotect, not confining himself to words procured the appointment of myconius to the college school of lucerne after this oswald no longer hesitated he saw the finger of god in the appointment and determined to make the sacrifice how great soever it might be who could say whether he might not be an instrument in the hand of the lord to diffuse the doctrine of peace in warlike lucerne but how painful the separation between zwinglius and myconius they parted in tears ulrich shortly after wrote to oswald your departure has been as serious a loss to the cause which i defend as that which is sustained by an army in battle array when one of its wings is destroyed ah i now am aware of all that my myconius was able to do and how often without my knowing it he maintained the cause of christ zwinglius felt the loss of his friend the more because the plague had left him in a state of great feebleness writing on the thirtieth of november fifteen nineteen he says it has weakened my memory and wasted my intellect when scarcely convalescent he had resumed all his labours but said he in preaching i often lose the thread of my discourse i feel languid in all my members and somewhat as if i were dead moreover zwinglius by his opposition to indulgences had excited the wrath of their partisans oswald strengthened his friend by letters which he wrote him from lucerne and did he not also receive pledges of assistance from the lord in the protection which he gave to the saxon champion who was gaining such important victories over rome what think you said myconius to zwinglius of the cause of luther for my part i have no fear either for the gospel or for him if god does not protect his truth who will protect it all that i ask of the lord is not to withdraw his aid from those who hold nothing dearer than his gospel continue as you have begun and an abundant recompense awaits you in heaven the visit of an old friend helped to console zwinglius for the loss of myconius bunsley who had been his teacher at baal and had succeeded the dean of wessen the reformer's uncle arrived at zurich in the first week of the year fifteen hundred and twenty and zwinglius and he thereafter resolved to set out together to baal to see their common friends 
this visit of zwinglius bore fruit oh my dear zwinglius wrote john glother to him at a later period never will i forget you the thing which binds me to you is the goodness with which during your stay at baal you came to see me me a petty schoolmaster living in obscurity without learning or merit and of humble station what wins me is the elegance of your manners and that indescribable meekness with which you subdue all hearts even stones if i may so speak but zwinglius's visit was still more useful to his old friends capito hedio and others were electrified by the power of his eloquence the former commencing in baal the work which zwinglius was doing at zurich began to expound the gospel of st matthew before an auditory which continued to increase the doctrine of christ penetrated and inflamed all hearts the people received it joyfully and with acclamation hailed the revival of christianity it was the aurora of the reformation accordingly a conspiracy of monks and priests was soon formed against capito it was at this time that albert the young cardinal archbishop of mentz who felt desirous of attaching a man of so much learning to his person called him to his court capito seeing the difficulties which were thrown in his way accepted the invitation the people were moved and turning with indignation against the priests raised a tumult in the town hedio was proposed as his successor but some objected to his youth while others said he is his pupil truth bites said hedio it is not advantageous to offend too delicate ears by telling it no matter nothing will turn me from the straight path the monks redoubled their efforts believe not those exclaimed they from the pulpit who say that the sum of christian doctrine is found in the gospel and in st paul scotus has done more for christianity than st paul himself all the learning that has ever been spoken or printed has been stolen from scotus all that has been done since by men eager for fame has been to throw in some greek and hebrew terms which have only darkened the matter the tumult increased and there was reason to fear that on capito's departure it would become still more serious i will be almost alone thought hedio poor i to struggle with these formidable monsters accordingly he invoked the assistance of god and wrote to zwinglius inflame my courage by writing often learning and christianity are now placed between the hammer and the anvil luther has just been condemned by the universities of louvain and cologne if ever the church was in imminent danger it is at this hour capito left baal for mentz twenty eighth of april and hedio succeeded him not content with the public assemblies in the church at which he continued his exposition of st matthew he proposed in the month of june as he wrote to luther to have private meetings in his own house to give more thorough evangelical instruction to those who might feel the want of it this powerful method of communicating the truth and exciting in the faithful an interest and zeal in divine things could not fail then as it never does to awaken opposition in the men of the world and in domineering priests both of whom though from different motives are equally desirous that god should be worshipped only within the precincts of a particular building but hedio was invincible at the same period when he formed this good resolution at baal there arrived at zurich one of those characters who often emerge like impure froth from the vortex of revolutions senator grebel a man of great influence in zurich had a son named conrad a youth of remarkable talents and a relentless enemy of ignorance and superstition which he attacked with cutting satire he was boisterous violent sarcastic and bitter in his expression without natural affection given to debauchery always talking loudly of his own innocence while he could see nothing but what was wrong in others we speak of him here because he is afterwards to play a melancholy part at this period vadian married a sister of conrad and conrad who was studying at paris where his misconduct had deprived him of the use of his limbs desiring to be present at the marriage 
appeared suddenly about the beginning of june amidst his family the poor father received the prodigal son with a gentle smile his fond mother with tears the tenderness of his parents made no change on his unnatural heart his kind and unhappy mother having some time after been brought to the gates of death conrad wrote to his brother-in-law vadian my mother is recovered she again rules the house sleeps awakes grumbles breakfasts scolds dines makes a racket sups and is perpetually a burden to us she runs cooks recooks sweeps the house toils kills herself with fatigue and will shortly bring on a relapse such was the man who at a later period pretended to lord it over zwinglius and who took the lead among fanatical anabaptists divine providence perhaps allowed such characters to appear at the period of the reformation that their disorders might the better bring out the wise christian and orderly spirit of the reformers everything announced that the battle between the gospel and the papacy was about to commence let us stir up the temporizers wrote hedio to zurich the peace is broken let us arm our hearts the enemies we shall have to combat are most fierce myconius wrote in the same strain to ulrich who however answered their warlike appeals with admirable meekness i should like said he to gain these obstinate men by kindness and good offices rather than overcome them by violence and disputation that they call our doctrine which however is not ours a doctrine of the devil is nothing more than natural it proves to me that we are indeed the ambassadors of christ the devils cannot be silent in his presence end of book eight chapter eight Book eight, chapter nine of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume two, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine. Though desirous to follow the path of meekness, Zwinglius was not idle. Since his illness, his preaching had become more profound and enlivening more than two thousand persons in zurich had received the word of god into their heart made profession of the evangelical doctrine and were themselves able to announce it zwinglius's faith was the same as luther's but more the result of reasoning luther advances with a bound zwinglius owes more to clearness of perception luther's writings are pervaded with a thorough personal conviction of the benefits which the cross of christ confers upon himself and this conviction glowing with heat and life is the soul of all he says the same thing doubtless exists in zwinglius but in an inferior degree he had looked more to the christian system as a whole and admired it particularly for its beauty for the light which it sheds into the human mind and the eternal life which it brings to the world the one is more the man of heart the other more the man of intellect and hence it is that those who do not experimentally know the faith which animated these two great disciples of the lord fall into the grossest error making the one a mystic and the other a rationalist the one is more pathetic perhaps in the exposition of his faith and the other more philosophical but both believe the same truths they do not however look at all secondary questions from the same point of view but that faith which is one that faith which quickens and justifies its possessor that faith which no confession no article of doctrine can express is in the one as in the other the doctrine of zwinglius has often been so much misrepresented that it seems proper here to give an account of what he preached at this time to the increasing crowds who flocked to the cathedral of zurich the fall of adam zwinglius regarded as the key to man's history before the fall said he one day man had been created with a free will so that he was able if he chose to keep the law his nature was pure being as yet untainted by the malady of sin 
his life was in his own hand but wishing to be equal to god he died and not he only but every one of his descendants all men being dead in adam none can be recalled to life until the spirit who is god himself raised them from death the people of zurich who listened eagerly to this powerful orator were saddened when he set before them the sinful state into which human nature has fallen but soon after heard words of joy and learned to know the remedy which is able to recall man to life christ very man and very god said the eloquent voice of this shepherd son of the tockenberg has purchased for us a redemption which will never terminate the eternal god died for us his passion then is eternal it brings salvation for ever and ever it appeases divine justice for ever in favour of all those who lean upon this sacrifice with firm and immovable faith wherever sin exists exclaimed the reformer death must necessarily supervene christ had no sin there was no guile in his mouth and yet he died ah it was because he died in our stead he was pleased to die in order to restore us to life and as he had no sins of his own the father who is full of mercy laid the burden of our sins upon him the christian orator continued since the will of man rebelled against the supreme god it was necessary if eternal order was to be re-established and man saved that the human will should be made subject in christ to the divine will he often repeated that it was for the faithful people of god that the expiatory death of jesus christ had been endured those in the city of zurich who were eager for salvation found rest on hearing these good news but old errors still remained and these it was necessary to destroy setting out from this great truth of a salvation which is the gift of god zwinglius forcibly discoursed against the pretended merit of human works since eternal salvation said he proceeds solely from the merits and death of jesus christ the merit of our works is nothing better than folly not to say rash impiety could we have been saved by our works it had not been necessary for jesus christ to die all who have ever come to god came to him by the death of jesus christ zwinglius perceived the objections which some of his hearers felt against these doctrines some of them called upon him and stated them he mounted the pulpit and said people more curious perhaps than pious object that this doctrine makes men giddy and dissolute but of what consequence are the objections or fears which human curiosity may suggest whosoever believes in jesus christ is certain that everything which comes from god is necessarily good if then the gospel is of god it is good and what other power would be capable of implanting among men innocence truth and love o oh god most compassionate most just father of mercies exclaimed he in the overflowing of his piety with what love hast thou embraced us us thy enemies with what great and certain hopes hast thou inspired us us who should have known nothing but despair and to what glory hast thou in thy son called our littleness and nothingness thy purpose in this ineffable love is to constrain us to yield thee love for love then dwelling on this idea he showed that love to the redeemer is a more powerful law than the commandments the christian said he delivered from the law depends entirely on christ christ is his reason his counsel his righteousness and whole salvation christ lives in him and acts in him christ alone guides him and he needs no other guide and making use of a comparison adapted to his hearers he added if a government prohibits its citizens under pain of death from receiving pensions and presents at the hands of princes 
how gentle and easy this law is to those who from love to their country and to liberty would of their own accord refrain from so culpable a proceeding but on the contrary how tormenting and oppressive it feels to those who think only of their own interest thus the righteous man lives joyful in the love of righteousness whereas the unrighteous walks groaning under the heavy weight of the law which oppresses him in the cathedral of zurich was a considerable number of veteran soldiers who felt the truth of these words is not love the mightiest of legislators is not everything that it commands instantly accomplished does not he whom we love dwell in our heart and does it not of itself perform what he enjoins accordingly zwinglius waxing bold declared to the people of zurich that love to the redeemer was alone capable of making man do things agreeable to god works done out of jesus christ are not useful said the christian orator since everything is done of him in him and by him what do we pretend to arrogate to ourselves wherever faith in god is there god is and wherever god is there is a zeal which presses and urges men to good works only take care that christ be in thee and thou in christ and then doubt not but he will work the life of the christian is just one continued work by which god begins continues and perfects in man everything that is good struck with the grandeur of this divine love which existed from eternity the herald of grace raised his voice to all the timid or irresolute can you fear said he to approach the tender father who has chosen you why has he chosen us in his grace why has he called us why has he drawn us was it that we might not dare to go to him such was the doctrine of zwinglius it was the doctrine of christ himself if luther preaches christ he does what i do said the preacher of zurich those who have been brought to christ by him are more numerous than those who have been brought by me but no matter i am unwilling to bear any other name than that of christ whose soldier i am and who alone is my head never was a single scrap written by me to luther or by luther to me and why in order to show to all how well the spirit of god accords with himself since without having heard each other we so harmoniously teach the doctrine of jesus christ thus zwinglius preached with energy and might the large cathedral could not contain the crowds of hearers all thanked god that a new life was beginning to animate the lifeless body of the church swiss from all the cantons brought to zurich either by the diet or by other causes being touched by this new preaching carried its precious seeds into all the helvetic valleys one acclamation arose from mountains and cities nicholas hagius writing from lucerne to zurich says switzerland has hitherto given birth to scipios caesars and brutuses but has scarcely produced two men who had the knowledge of jesus christ and could nourish men's hearts not with vain disputes but with the word of god now that divine providence gives switzerland zwinglius for its orator and oswald myconius for its teacher virtue and sacred literature revive among us o oh, happy helvetia could you but resolve at length to rest from all your wars and already so celebrated become still more celebrated for righteousness and peace it was said wrote myconius to zwinglius that your voice could not be heard three yards off but i now see it was a falsehood for all switzerland hears you you possess intrepid courage wrote hedio to him from baal i will follow you as far as i am able i have heard you said sebastian hofmeister of schaffhausen writing to him from constance ah would to god that zurich which is at the head of our happy confederation was delivered from the disease and health thus restored to the whole body but zwinglius met with opponents as well as admirers to what end said some does he intermeddle with the affairs of switzerland 
why said others does he in his religious instructions constantly repeat the same things amid all these combats the soul of zwinglius was often filled with sadness all seemed to be in confusion as if society were turned upside down he thought it impossible that anything new should appear without something of an opposite nature being immediately displayed when a hope sprang up in his heart a fear immediately sprang up beside it still he soon raised his head the life of man here below said he is a war he who desires to obtain glory must attack the world in front and like david make this haughty goliath who seems so proud of his stature to bite the dust the church said he like luther has been acquired by blood and must be renewed by blood the more numerous the defilements in it the more we must arm ourselves like hercules in order to clean out these augean stables i have little fear for luther added he even should he be thundered against by the bolts of this jupiter zwinglius stood in need of repose and repaired to the waters of baden the curate of the place an old papal guard a man of good temper but completely ignorant had obtained his benefice by carrying a halberd true to his soldier habits he spent the day and part of the night in jovial company while Stahelli, his vicar, was indefatigable in fulfilling the duties of his office. Zwinglius invited the young minister to his house. "'I have need of Swiss help,' said he to him, and from this moment Stendi was his fellow labourer. Zwinglius, Stahelli, and Luti, afterwards pastor of Winterthur, lived under the same roof. The devotedness of Zwinglius was not to pass unrewarded the word of god preached with so much energy could not fail to produce fruit several magistrates were gained experiencing the word to be their consolation and their strength the council grieved at seeing the priests and especially the monks shamelessly delivering from the pulpit whatever came into their heads passed a resolution ordering them not to advance anything in their discourses that they did not draw from the sacred sources of the old and new testament it was in fifteen hundred and twenty that the civil power thus interposed for the first time in the work of the reformation acting as a christian magistrate say some since the first duty of the magistrate is to maintain the word of god and defend the best interests of the citizens depriving the church of its liberty say others by subjecting it to secular power and giving the signal for the series of evils which have since been engendered by the connection between the church and state we will not give any opinion here on this great controversy which in our day is carried on with so much warmth in several countries it is sufficient for us to point out its commencement at the period of the reformation but there is another thing also to be pointed out the act of these magistrates was itself one of the effects produced by the preaching of the word of god at this period the reformation in switzerland ceased to be the work of private individuals and began to be included within the national domain born in the heart of a few priests and literary men it extended rose and took up elevated ground like the waters of the ocean it gradually increased till it had overflowed an immense extent the monks were confounded they were ordered to preach nothing but the word of god and the greater part of them had never read it opposition provokes opposition the resolution of the council became the signal of more violent attacks on the reformation plots began to be formed against the curate of zurich his life was in danger one evening when zwinglius and his vicars were quietly conversing in their house some citizens arrived in great haste and asked are your doors well bolted be this night on your guard such alarms were frequent adds Stahelli, but we were well armed and a guard was stationed for us in the street in other places means still more violent were resorted to an old man of schaffhausen named galster a man of piety and of an ardour rare at his period of life 
happy in the light which he had found in the gospel, laboured to communicate it to his wife and children. His zeal, perhaps indiscreet, openly attacked the relics, priests, and superstitions with which this cantum abounded. He soon became an object of hatred and terror, even to his own family. The old man, penetrating their fatal designs, left his home broken-hearted, and fled to the neighbouring forest. There he lived several days, subsisting on whatever he could find, when, suddenly, on the last night of the year 1520, torches blazed in all directions through the forest, and the cries of men and the barking of dogs re-echoed under its dark shades. The council had ordered a hunt in the woods to discover him. The dogs scented him out, and the unhappy old man was dragged before the magistrate. He was ordered to abjure his faith, but remained immovable, and was beheaded. End of Book 8, Chapter 9Book 8, Chapter 10 of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume 2, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The year, the first day of which was signalized by this bloody execution, had scarcely commenced when Zwinglius was waited on in his house at Zurich by a young man of about twenty-eight years of age, tall in stature, and with an exterior which bespoke candour, simplicity, and diffidence. He said his name was Berthold Haller. Zwinglius, on hearing the name, embraced the celebrated preacher of Bern with that affability which made him so engaging. Haller, born at Aldingen in Württemberg, had first studied at Rottweil under Rubellus, and afterwards at Furtzheim, where Simla was his teacher, and Melanchthon his fellow-student. The Bernese, who had already distinguished themselves by arms, at this time resolved to invite literature into the bosom of their republic. Rubellus and Berthold, not twenty-one years of age, repaired thither. Some time after, the latter was appointed canon and, ultimately, preacher of the cathedral. The gospel which Zwinglius preached had extended to Bern. Haller believed, and thenceforth longed to see the distinguished man whom he now looked up to as his father. He went to Zurich after Myconius had announced his intended visit. Thus met Haller and Zwinglius. The former, a man of great meekness, unbosomed his griefs, and the latter, a man of might, inspired him with courage. One day Berthold said to Zwinglius, My spirit is overwhelmed. I am not able to bear all this injustice. I mean to give up the pulpit and retire to Baal beside Wittenbach, and there occupy myself exclusively with sacred literature. Ah, replied Zwinglius, I, too, have my feelings of despondency, when unjust attacks are made upon me. But Christ awakens my conscience, and urges me on by his terrors and his promises. He alarms me when he says, Whoso shall be ashamed of me before men, of him will I be ashamed before my father. And he sets my mind at ease when he adds, Whoso shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my father. My dear Berthold, rejoice. Our name is written in indelible characters in the register of citizenship on high. I am ready to die for Christ. Let your wild cubs, added he, hear the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and you will see them become tame. But this task must be performed with great gentleness, lest they turn again and rend you. Haller's courage revived. My soul, said he to Zwinglius, is awakened out of its sleep. I must preach the gospel. Jesus Christ must again be established in this city from which he has been so long exiled. 
thus the torch of berthold was kindled at the torch of zwinglius and the timid haller threw himself into the midst of the ferocious bears who as zwinglius expresses it were gnashing their teeth and seeking to devour him it was in another part of switzerland however that persecution was to begin warlike lucerne came forward like a foe in full armour couching his lance in this canton which was favourable to foreign service a martial spirit predominated and the leading men knit their brows when they heard words of peace fitted to curb their warlike temper meanwhile the writings of luther having found their way into the town some of the inhabitants began to examine them and were horrified it seemed to them that an infernal hand had traced the lines their imagination was excited their senses became bewildered and their rooms seemed as if filled with demons flocking around them and glaring upon them with a sarcastic smile they hastily closed the book and dashed it from them in dismay oswald who had heard of these singular visions did not speak of luther to any but his most intimate friends and contented himself with simply preaching the gospel of christ nevertheless the cry which rung through the town was luther and the schoolmaster myconius must be burnt i am driven by my adversaries like a ship by the raging billows said oswald to one of his friends one day in the beginning of the year fifteen hundred and twenty he was unexpectedly summoned to appear before the council and told your orders are not to read the writings of luther to your pupils not to name him in their presence and not even to think of him the lords of lucerne pretended it seems to have a very extensive jurisdiction shortly after a preacher delivered a sermon against heresy the whole audience was moved and every eye was turned on myconius for whom but he could the preacher have in his eye oswald kept quietly in his seat as if the matter had not concerned him but on leaving the church as he was walking with his friend canon xylotect one of the councillors still under great excitement passed close to them and passionately exclaimed well disciples of luther why don't you defend your master they made no answer i live said myconius among fierce wolves but i have this consolation that the most of them are without teeth they would bite if they could but not being able they bark the senate assembled for the people began to be tumultuous he is a lutheran said one of the councillors he is a propagator of new doctrines said another he is a seducer of youth said a third let him appear let him appear the poor schoolmaster appeared and again listened to prohibitions and menaces his unsophisticated soul was torn and overwhelmed his gentle spouse could only console him by shedding tears every one is rising up against me exclaimed he in his agony assailed by so many tempests whither shall i turn how shall i escape were it not for christ i would long ago have fallen under these assaults what matters it wrote dr sebastian hofmeister of constance to him whether lucerne chooses to keep you or not the whole earth is the lord's every land is a home to the brave though we should be the most wicked of men our enterprise is just for we teach the word of christ while the truth encountered so many obstacles at lucerne it was victorious at zurich zwinglius was incessant in his labours wishing to examine the whole sacred volume in the original tongues he zealously engaged in a study of hebrew under the direction of john boschenstein a pupil of reuchlin but if he studied scripture it was to preach it the peasants who flocked to the market on friday to dispose of their goods showed an eagerness to receive the word of god to satisfy their longings zwinglius had begun in december fifteen twenty to expound the psalms every friday after studying the original the reformers always combined learned with practical labours the latter forming the end the former only the means 
they were at once students and popular teachers this union of learning and charity is characteristic of the period in regard to his services on sunday zwinglius after lecturing from st matthew on the life of our saviour proceeded afterwards to show from the acts of the apostles how the gospel was propagated thereafter he laid down the rules of the christian life according to the epistles to timothy employed the epistle to the galatians in combating doctrinal errors combined it with the two epistles of st peter in order to show to the despisers of st paul that both apostles were animated by the same spirit and concluded with the epistle to the hebrews in order to give a full display of the benefits which christians derive from jesus christ their sovereign priest but zuinglius did not confine his attention to adults he sought also to inspire youth with the sacred flame by which his own breast was animated one day in fifteen hundred and twenty one while he was sitting in his study reading the fathers of the church taking extracts of the most striking passages and carefully arranging them into a large volume his door opened and a young man entered whose appearance interested him exceedingly it was henry bullinger who was returning from germany and impatient to become acquainted with the teacher of his country whose name was already famous in christendom the handsome youth fixed his eye first on zwinglius and then on the books and felt his vocation to do what zwinglius was doing zwinglius received him with his usual cordiality which won all hearts this first visit had great influence on the future life of the student who was on his return to the paternal hearth another youth had also won zwinglius's heart this was gerald meyer of knonau his mother anna reinhardt who afterwards occupied an important place in the reformer's life had been a great beauty and was still distinguished for her virtues john meyer of knonau a youth of a noble family who had been brought up at the court of the bishop of constance had conceived a strong passion for anna who however belonged to a plebeian family old meyer of knonau had refused his consent to their marriage and after it took place disinherited his son in fifteen thirteen anna was left a widow with a son and two daughters and devoted herself entirely to the education of her poor orphans the grandfather was inexorable one day however the widow's maidservant having in her arms young gerald then a beautiful sprightly child of three years of age stopped at the fish market when old meyer who was looking out at a window observed him and continuing to gaze after him asked to whom that beautiful lively child belonged it is your son's child was the answer the heart of the old man was moved the ice immediately melted all was forgotten and he clasped in his arms the widow and children of his son Zwinglius loved, as if he had been his own son, the noble and intrepid youth Gerald, who was to die in the flower of his age side by side with the reformer, with his sword in his hand, and surrounded, alas, with the dead bodies of his enemies. Thinking that Gerald would not be able to prosecute his studies at Zurich, Zwinglius, in 1521, sent him to Baal young knonau did not find hedio the friend of zinglius there capito being obliged to accompany the archbishop albert to the coronation of charles v had procured hedio to supply his place baal having thus one after another lost her most faithful preachers the church there seemed forsaken but other men appeared four thousand hearers squeezed into the church of william rubli curate of st alban he attacked the mass purgatory and the invocation of saints but this turbulent man who was eager to draw the public attention upon himself declaimed more against error than in support of truth on corpus christi day he joined the public procession but in place of the customary relics caused the holy scriptures to be carried before him splendidly bound and bearing this inscription the bible this is the true relic the others are only dead bones courage adorns the servant of god 
affectation disgraces him the work of an evangelist is to preach the bible and not to make a presumptuous display of it the enraged priests accused rubli before the council a mob immediately gathered in cordelier square protect our preacher said the citizens to the council fifty ladies of distinction interceded in his behalf but rubli was obliged to quit baal at a later period he took part like grebel in anabaptist disorders the reformation in the course of its development everywhere threw off the chaff which mingled with the good grain at this period a modest voice was heard from the humblest of the chapels clearly proclaiming the evangelical doctrine it was that of young wolfgang wissenberger son of a councillor of state and chaplain of the hospital all in baal who felt new religious wants attached themselves to the gentle chaplain preferring him to the presumptuous rubli wolfgang began to read the mass in german the monks renewed their clamour but this time they failed and wissenberger continued to preach the gospel for says an old chronicler he was a burgess and his father a counsellor this first success of the reformation in baal while it was the prelude of still greater success at the same time tended greatly to promote the progress of the work throughout the confederation zurich no longer stood alone learned baal began to be charmed with the new doctrine the foundations of the new temple were enlarged the reformation in switzerland obtained a fuller development the centre of the movement was however at zurich but to the deep grief of zwinglius important political events occurred in fifteen twenty one and in some measure distracted men's minds from the preaching of the gospel leo x who had offered his alliance at once to charles v and francis i had at last declared for the emperor war between the two rivals was on the point of breaking out in italy the french general lautrec had said there will be nothing left of the pope but his ears this bad jest increased the pontiff's anger the king of france claimed the aid of the swiss cantons all of which with the exception of zurich had formed an alliance with him he obtained it the pope flattered himself he would gain zurich and the cardinal of zion ever given to intrigue and confident in his ability and his finesse hastened thither to obtain soldiers for his master but from his old friend zwinglius he encountered a vigorous opposition he was indignant that the swiss should sell their blood to strangers and his imagination figured to itself the swords of the zurichers under the standard of the pope and the emperor in the plains of italy crossing the swords of the confederates united under the colours of france at such scenes of fratricide his patriotic and christian soul shuddered with horror thundering from the pulpit he exclaimed would you rend and overthrow the confederation we attack the wolves which devour our flocks but offer no resistance to those who prowl around seeking to devour men ah it is not without cause that these hats and mantles are of scarlet shake their robes and ducats and crowns will tumble out of them twist them and you will see the blood of your brother your father your son and your dearest friend trickling down from them the energetic voice of zwinglius was heard in vain the cardinal with the red hat succeeded and two thousand seven hundred zurichers set out under the command of george burger zwinglius was heartbroken still however his influence was not lost for a long time the banners of zurich were not again to be unfurled and passed the gates of the town in the cause of foreign powers end of book eight chapter ten